but why do you want people to like if people are happy following religion like like why what's your problem like you know what i mean yes like, good question so th there is an argument to be made for religion in the sense of its utility its community etc however i think there's bad ideas in religion and bad ideas uh, translate into bad behaviors and we can see it across the world it's not just religious people by the way so i'm not claiming it's only religious people of course you know there's bad atheists bad everybody um, but there's specific right. doctrines for example in islam that say certain things i could improve the quran in one sentence all i have to do is borrow the first tenet of jainism the ancient indian religion which says do no harm to any living creature if that was the first v verse in the quran we would not ever be talking about any Muslim suicide bombers, they would be people who might have believed and aren't anymore. You know, the more fundamentalist the Jain becomes, as Sam Harris has said, the more the less you have to worry about them. And it's quite the opposite yeah. in Islam. Yes, that's true. And Islam kind of presents itself in a way that it's a balanced uh, life. So, you know, when you said don't harm other people, uh, sorry, don't harm any other living creature. Well, animals are here to serve us, you know, and, uh, you know, the Islamic view is that, well, God created us and he's the one that gets to decide what's right and wrong. So slavery, well, you know what, like if God decides that slavery is okay, then according to Islam, then yes, slavery is okay. Right? It's, I guess it's a divine command theory, is that what it's called? It's God says so, therefore it's right. Yes, so they've got a lot of instructions that come down. The problem with divine command theory is it doesn't give them an ethical system to face a challenge that is not in the Quran. So ask a Muslim, what, what is their position on stem cell research or cloning or something else that's not in the Quran and now notice what they have to do. There's nothing in the Quran that tells them because they, they're following a list of instructions. So God told me to do X, I will follow that, otherwise there's severe consequences. But the Quran doesn't cover everything as we know. So ask them, well, what would you do in this scenario and now notice what happens? What do they do? How do they appeal to work out whether it's right or wrong? And we have, I believe, as, as non-believers, secular humanist or whatever term we want to use we've got systems that we can use to give us answers at least in principle if not in practice and uh, you made an interesting point where you know when it comes back to muslims they're always tied down to what muhammad said and did in the seventh century and that becomes the basis of everything that ever happened and if it's so coincidentally ended up being the case that somebody asked muhammad like what do we do about this and then he said something, well, from now on, forever and ever, Muslims are tied to that specific ruling just because coincidentally, or they would say according to, you know, Allah intended it to happen. For example, right, it so happened to be that in the life of, according to the official story, so, you know, most of the time when I talk about Islam, I acknowledge and I accept the fact that the Hadith literature, you know, it, it's problematic. There's a lot of issues with it. But for the sake of discussion, because Muslims accept that this is true, for the most part, it, it, it helps to, you know, to start the dialogue. So according to the Hadith, you know, according to the story, Prophet Muhammad, you know, he would say, the, actually a Jew came to him, or Jews would come to him and say, As-Samu Alaikum, meaning like death be upon you, not As-Salamu Alaikum, you know, peace be upon you. And so he would say, wa alaykum, meaning, and the same to you. And then according to the hadith, Aisha got mad and said, did you hear what he said to you? He said, death be upon you. And, you know, she cursed the Jewish person back. And, you know, th there's a lot of uh, anti-Semitism in the hadith literature. So this is one example of that. Of course, there's bad Jews, you know, cursing the prophet, like bad, bad Jews. Anyways, so because of this, you know, according, at least according to the Salafi understanding, until the day of judgment, if someone says, and by the way, this creates a lot of awkwardness, and I'm sure the intro, intro has experienced this as well. When you say assalamu alaikum to someone, they don't know what to say to you. It's like, I'm telling you, I've had, I've had experiences where I'm like, assalamu alaikum to someone, they're like, wa alaikum, yeah, wa hey, hey, how's it going? And they're not sure if, they're not even sure if they're allowed to tell you, like, Wa alaikum salam, peace be upon you. Because according to the hadith, the Prophet said, if a non-Muslim says anything, like, you know, greets you, you're supposed to respond with, like, Wa alaikum, like, and to you, not Wa alaikum salam, right? Yeah, so, I, I definitely had that happen, though. I want to just share that uh, there was a Christian that actually knew that yeah. um, he should be deserving of getting the greetings of peace. And I did say Wa alaikum to him. And he was just like, you're not going to give me the full salam? 
I was like, oh man, he knows about it. So it it, it does create an awkward situation. Yeah, it's worse with non Muslim with Arab Christians and Jews because they know about this, right? So they're like, they feel like, why are you guys, why are you treating us like this? Like, you know, like, can't you, it's, it's so silly. Like, you know what I mean? Because of this very particular thing that happened. And, uh, you know, there's other examples of this as well. We can think of one, another example I can think of is like, um, Prophet Muhammad in the Hadith says that I would have forbidden you guys from, from doing it while your, while your wife is breastfeeding. So in Islam, you're supposed to breastfeed. The mom's supposed to breastfeed for two years. So he was going to forbid all Muslim men from breastfeed, from having sex with the wife for two full years, or at least until she's done breastfeeding, because he thought it was going to create some sort of harm. But then he saw those omens were doing it, and the, the kids are fine, so it's okay. So it's halal. Because apparently, you know, and and I think you know maybe some of even the some of the rulings in Islam tend to kind of show this seventh century mentality where, like, you can't marry your foster sister. Meaning, if if there's a lady who you you got married to, and someone tells her, by the way, I breastfed you and I breastfed your husband, like, you know, forty five years ago. You guys become haram for each other. You, you can no longer be married because she's your foster sister. So it's almost like the milk has some metaphysical power to make you related. Excuse me. And so it's like Muslims, um, sorry, the Prophet probably thought that, you know, it affects the blood or something. And, you know, so, so we see a lot of examples like that in Islam. And, you know, just going on that, I had actually a real situation where I had a friend uh, who... He had a foster sister, just like you said, and just because his mother breastfed her, uh, no other relation other than that. He was telling me like he's so attracted to his uh, foster sister, and uh, he even thought about marrying her. But then he convinced himself that he had a jinn in him, and uh, it just you know hell broke loose, like started family drama and things like that. And you know uh, he had to like program his mind. The imam had to like come in and deprogram his attractiveness to her. Just because uh, she was breastfed yeah. by the same mother. And it's not like she's not really a sister, right? I mean, she's just another lady that happened to drink some milk. Like like me and me and some me and my wife, we've drank milk from the same cow. Like that cow doesn't become my mom, but why does it why does it become like your mom if it's a human? It's weird, right? Like um and the other example I can think of like this has to do with with uh mahram, right? The idea of mahram and how if someone's mahram to you, sorry, if someone's not mahram to you, like let's say you want to adopt someone. So if I wanted to adopt a daughter in Islam, because she's not mahram to me, she's not related by blood, um, I'm not allowed to touch her, I'm not allowed to kiss her. So even if I adopted her and she was my child, you know, it would create problems for the relationship. So people have to do all sorts of weird workarounds. And I have family members that actually had adopted. And what they did was, well, first they tried taking some sort of drugs to, you know, to get the milk, the best milk, so they could breastfeed the baby, so the baby would become mahram. If that didn't work, then they, you know, they went to another extent of getting the sister to breastfeed the baby. So, so legally, the baby becomes like a nephew slash niece, you know, and that way you can be alone with them and all that stuff. Otherwise, you know, the prophet said a man and a woman cannot be alone except shaitan is a third person with them. So, you know, in order to avoid this like uncomfortable situation of like having a non mahram living in your house, and all of this had to do with Zainab, right? All of this had to do with because Muhammad wanted to marry Zainab. So he made adoption, you know, forbidden. And I have a full video on that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's lots of funny examples like that. I think so, that does something to your mind, man. Uh, like the, the hadith where it says shaitan is the third person. Because every time I was alone with a woman in a room, I thought about that hadith, and that just heightened emotions, and that made you more paranoid, and it, it just made it a dirty situation. So I think there's a lot of uh, psychological implications with that hadith. So damaging. I. Yeah, but if I, you I, I want, the opposite I want... way now, if you look at the way that the the Sharia is structured, it is actually possible for you to go and have sex with your own daughter. Because if you have a wife and she has a daughter, then you get divorced and you then go to the daughter. You are actually allowed to marry her. And this is not haram in Islam. You mean, you mean your adopted sons? Uh, your no, no, adopted... no, 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 no. No, it's your physical daughter. Say that again? You are, under certain circumstances, allowed to have sex with your own physical daughter. I've never heard of this before. 
That's yeah. It. I know a lot of Muslims don't know this because what you, what happens, the way that it works is that you, according to Sharia, according to Hadith, you can divorce somebody where you have had a daughter with that woman. And then if you then go and the daughter comes and lives with you, you are allowed to have sex with her. Uh, I, don't know that's, with her. I don't know if that's true because she's still your yeah. daughter and she still inherits from you, according to the Quran. And we have examples of people that divorce the the wives, and the daughter is still mahram. I mean, I I've never heard that before. I don't know, based on what you've heard that, but uh, maybe that's not correct because my understanding is your daughter is always your daughter, whether your wife dies or you know she doesn't die, she inherits from you, she takes your name, like you know what I mean. So I I don't think that's I don't think that's correct to be honest. By the way, I'm speaking from Sunni Islam, so I don't know anything about Shia Islam. I don't know anything about. I mean, I don't. No, I don't know anything. But like, I'm I'm speaking from my understanding as a Sunni Muslim that yeah. this is not the case. But if it's your if it's your stepdaughter, that's a different story. Uh, your stepdaughter would be like, yeah, I, I'm not sure. And that's again a questionable case because um, your stepdaughter is like mahram to you. Again, kind of weirdly, not weirdly, but makes sense. Uh, but then, does she stay mahram to you if you divorce the father? I don't know. These are all like, you know, strange rules, strange, strange ancient Islamic rules that came out of Muhammad's head. So who knows what he was thinking? Yeah, but the this is that, exactly one of the constructs, and, and I need to look it up because this, this was also weird for me, but it, it, there is a construct that allows that. Um, I just can't remember in which video I did this. I can't from the, you know, from the top of my head remember where I used That's fine, that's fine. Could you, guys, um, could you guys speak on incest? Because I've been challenged in the park once and there's a video there with a Muslim, you know, who's, who's a bit disingenuous. A, it, it does not, the critical thinking is not that particularly high, but it's also somebody that misrepresents people's position. And so I was asked, hey, do you think it's okay for a, here's the position, he's, he's very specific on it. Do you, Rob, as an atheist, think that it's okay for a son to have sex, uh, a son that's over 18, that's an adult, to have sex with his mother if the two of them say it's okay. So this now for him is direct incest. And my position, because I never really thought about this, so my position uh, is or was, um, if we can demonstrate in some scientific way that it's either biologically, neurologically, or physiologically negative, then we can, we've can. we got a right to say it's wrong over and above their assertion that, yeah, it's great. If we don't have that, then on what grounds? Now, I wouldn't do it, and it's not something, and I would be quite repulsed by that, but in order for me to say it's wrong for other people, I need something other than my own opinion and my own feelings. Uh, could you talk right. about that from an Islamic point of view as well? Because I do think that there is um, incest is allowed from first cousins, etc. So what would be your right. view firstly as a non-believer, and then what would you say from an Islamic point of view? Okay, so uh, first of all, yeah, cousin marriage is definitely allowed in Islam. Uh, in terms of, um, yeah, what was I going to say? Okay, so so yeah, marrying, oh yeah, what I was going to say was, it just shows you that the fact that cousin marriage is considered okay, but not marrying your, like, you know, milk sister, um, it shows you just how how much the, the reference of 7th century Arabia was to Islam, because, you know, the whole idea of foster motherhood, it was a very big part of pre-Islamic Arabia and Islamic Arabia, of course, as well. Um, and the cousin thing, I don't know what the reason for that is, but I have looked into this a bit uh, from a non-believer's perspective. And from a believer's perspective, it's easy. It says in the Quran, you know, hurrimat alaykum ummahatukum wa manatukum wa manat. Like, so the Quran says, haram to you, forbidden for you is your mother and this and this and this and your, you know, and the one that you, your foster sisters and included in that list, despite it, despite there being no good reason for that. So as a, as a Muslim, I'm like, yeah, that's easy. God says so, so that's it. Now, as a non-Muslim, you know, I've read, I happen to be, um, I just started reading a, a bit of um, stuff on ethics. And uh, Peter Singer has actually discussed this in his book. He talks about how a parent-child relationship, uh, ancestral relationship would be harmful, um, you know, psychologically. There's a power, there's a power imbalance, just like, you know, in Islam, you have a, power imbalance between between a slave owner and a slave so to allow you know the slave owner to have sex with his child with his um, slaves it's you know it, it's not a proper situation where you can give meaningful consent so for that reason and he kind of elaborates if you want to look up peter singer 
uh, incest, and he explains why, you know, the parent-child relationship. Now, in terms of brother-sister incest, he actually talks about that as well. And he says, normally, when you grow up, you know, together, and you grow together, you naturally uh, don't have, you know, you, you, you're repulsed by your sister because you grow up together, and there's a biological reason for that, because the people that would have done incest back then would have all died out because it creates harmful genetic you know situations uh you know the ideal the ideal situation is you have a little bit of distance between yourself and your p potential partner so if if it was the case that people were attracted to their siblings back at some point in history they would they would have been eliminated and we are the ancestors that survived because you know we were we, we had a different type of you know sexual attraction than those ones may have had now, he does say that there's been cases where a brother and sister have actually grown up completely apart from each other, fallen in love with each other, and then they got married, or they were like sleeping together basically, right? And then they found out. So the question is like, what do they do now? And he was saying, you know, because it happens so rarely, it, it, like, it doesn't, in a situation like that, there's a lot of social taboos which make it difficult but it, it's even worse because it becomes illegal and you can go to jail and it's actually not hurting anybody right so the way i look at ethics now is who's being hurt by this relationship what's the harm right and that's how i judge my morality. that's that's the basis of my morality now is what what are the harms and benefits so if it's not hurting anyone in a situation like that and it happens once in a you know 100 years and there's no issue with having kids because you can't say it's bad because of genetic defects because now what happens is well what about what about you know two two people that are genetically related and if they do it they'll have kids that have a high defect rate you know what i'm saying like a high child abnormality rate so if you make that like forbidden and you have to make this forbidden and illegal as well so you, that can't be the basis for whether we judge right and wrong right so that's kind of like what i've yeah that's that's basically it. and uh, that's a good point about uh, adam and eve's uh, according to Muslim Muslims, you know, some Muslims, they, they believe Adam and Eve's children committed incest repeatedly to make all of humanity, which of course makes no sense. But yeah, okay, that's that's all I have to say. Should I, uh, because I found this thing with the daughter, should I give you the context? Yeah, uh, sure, yeah, go ahead, yep. Okay, let me explain this, we're using an example based on even Arabi, one of the, it's, it's a Shafi, okay? So a Muslim man has sex with a married Muslim woman. She becomes pregnant, establishing extramarital sex. As per Sharia, the man receives 100 lashes and the woman is sentenced to be stoned. At age two, the baby girl is taken away from her mother. The stoning is postponed indefinitely because in some countries, but some, you know, it's, stoning is somewhat unacceptable and the woman goes to jail. The child goes into a foster home. The woman is now divorced, later marries her sex partner, who, when the daughter turns nine, marries her too because she is not considered his legal lineage due to her birth out of wedlock. So he's Which married to the daughter and the own daughter at the same time. Which book is this? Um, this is based on Ibn al-Arabi. Okay, so, so this is a situation where your daughter is illegitimate daughter, you're saying? Correct. Oh, I n I don't know that. I never heard of this before. That's interesting. You you could be right actually. Uh, that's that's very interesting because I've heard as well that in some some scholars you know consider that your illegitimate child does not inherit from you. I don't know. Like I never looked into this, but yes. that's that's kind of creepy. And it actually brings up a good point I wanted to mention, uh, which I forgot to mention earlier on, which is how you know when you compare secular law, you know, tort law to like. Islamic law, when you look into the books of, um, when you look into these legal books, like the Hanifi books especially, you see the most weird shit that you can imagine. Like if a man has sex with an animal, he doesn't need to take a bath or something. Like all sorts of weird, weird stuff. And it's like, well, how many drops have emitted? <laughs> All sorts of crazy stuff. Like it's just like like, and most Muslims don't know this. Right? They don't they don't read these books. But if they read these books, they're like completely shocked because, I mean, it's all sorts of weird stuff in there, right? Because it all has to go back to what Muhammad said and this guy said and that guy said and how they interpreted and what was preserved. And so you're stuck with this this you know going back to this very shady shaky uh, foundation, right? For everything. And like like uh, Rob was saying about about um, you know cloning and like 
you have to go back to see what Muhammad said that maybe somehow could have been interpreted in such a way that someone can kind of understand and then make an analogy and say, okay, therefore cloning is haram or halal. Like it's it's like what's the that's the that's the challenge I think for Muslims, right? And and a lot of them don't think about this. And the thing is that what the, the point that Rob was making, I think, is an excellent one too, because if you are looking at the way that things need to be interpreted, how do you know that the next guy is going to interpret it the same way? So if you have a relationship be between a man and a woman, the thing is what most Muslims don't understand. If I want to have sex with my mother, theoretically, I may be able to do that without any kind of remorse. But practically, and this is the point that he made, he is repulsed by it. And this is the point. I do not need a Muhammad telling me what to do. I do not need a Quran to tell me what to do, whether this is right or wrong and whether I feel bad about it or not. And this is the thing, because I hear a lot of Muslims telling me, yeah, but you can just indulge in whatever. So you go clubbing and you rape any woman that you can and you want to because you don't have to worry about anything. And this is the point. No, my morality is a lot higher than theirs because they are not doing it for the fear of being punished or they do something for a reward. Whereas if I do something good, I do it because I want to. And if I don't do something, it's because I don't want to. And this is something they don't understand. Yeah, they definitely don't understand that uh, because they have so many weird rules. Like according to the Quran and Hadith, um, if a woman marries her husband and let's say she gets a divorce from that husband and then she seeks out another man, and she marries that man, but then realizes she made a mistake marrying that second man. According to Islamic law, according to the Quran and Hadith, she has to have sex with that second man before, before she divorces him and go goes out with that uh, you know first man that she realized she made a mistake with. This is the problem with the Muslims. Like when you have like seventh century Arabian rules that don't have a justification or make sense. Uh, I have so many Muslims that will question me and say, what are you doing now with your life now that you left Islam? Like, do you think it's okay to go rape people? And, and it's just what Rob was saying. Like, I understand where Muslims are coming from when they ask them questions like that because uh, they want to get into this objective morality argument. They're trying to trap uh, people like Rob and others to say, well, do you think it's okay to do this? You, what, uh, why or why not? Uh, because they don't understand it everything is based on seventh century arabian rules yeah and i think i would just to... uh, carry on sorry go ahead go ahead i was just gonna say problem with islam not problem with muslims but yeah go ahead uh, rob i think a lot of the problems would go away for muslims if they would just accept that the book was done in whatever sense it was done even in the seventh century and it was meant for seventh century the big problem comes and that's why we're all talking here, I suspect, a great deal of the time and taking some of our energy is because they are claiming that it's a book for all time, for all people. And A, it's not, you know, you don't understand Arabic, so you have to accept English translations, of which there are multiple. And then when you when you question the English translations or they change over time, as they have with the Hubble's expanding universe in 1925, now we run into some problems. So if they drop that claim, we could all go, do you know what? Okay, that was what was happening in the seventh century. It's not great today. We understand what that's what the people did because they didn't know any better. But of course, what they're trying to say is, no, 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 this book is for everybody for all time. Now they're trying, because they've had a collision with Western modernity, now they're desperately trying to make it fit so that it'll be palatable for people in the West. And that, of course, just appears in, untenable. And so they make up all kinds of you know, things or there's certain interpretations that now are trying in some desperate way to make it okay for us. And I'm sure that our, uh, the, the, the people on this panel look through this and just go, you guys are just trying to make something up here to try and make it fit. It's fine in the, you know, in the Middle East, they don't have this problem, marrying nine-year-olds and doing X, Y, and Z. That's all fine where they're the majority and that's what they've been taught. But when they come over to, you know, our Western countries now, oh my goodness, now they're bringing over what we consider barbaric ideas, and now there's a challenge. Well, oh, there's a scramble to try and make it more palatable for the Western society, and that, of course, is where it trips them up. Yeah, and I think it's they're trying to make it palatable for young Muslims growing up in the Middle East as well, were exposed to the internet. Yes, I had somebody when I spoke in Speakers Corner. I was amazed. I had a, a general, a youngish gentleman, early twenties, from Saudi Arabia, saying to me, "Rob, uh, you wouldn't believe it. There's, a, you know, in Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of young Muslims that are growing up that are using the internet, that are 
rejecting a great deal of the teaching. Maybe they're still Muslims to some degree, but, but far more nominal in the sense that they don't follow, you know, the Wahhabi, Salafist type approach. Um, and they want to find out, they want to explore the world, they want to get different ideas. And of course, people like Sam Harris and, and you know, some of the, you know, the more famous atheists get hundreds, if not thousands, and, and ex-Muslims as well, Sarah Hader, and you name all of them. They're getting hundreds and thousands of emails saying, you know what, I watched your stuff and it's changed my life. And that's where I believe the biggest value is, is the internet and the, the exchange of ideas. That's going to be the, in a sense, the biggest challenge for Islam to overcome. Yeah, but hang on, even in, in Dubai, you have the so-called forbidden pages. <clears throat> like if I, in, in, in Dubai, for example, I entered something about the, uh, the Council of Ex-Muslims in, in Britain, for example, it came up with a forbidden page where you have a huge big banner saying you're not allowed to access this. If this is an error, contact the information ministry and we'll open the page. But they are restricting it left, right and center and even more so, even, even in Dubai, even more so than if you go to Kabul, for example, where half the internet is blocked. Yeah, I've, I've heard about, I wanted to actually, I, I really wanted to kind of get the lowdown on this and how bad it is, because I'm not even sure how bad it is, but what I've heard is uh, many of the websites are blocked. I know for sure Saudi, I know for sure, um, and I'm not even sure which countries block which, but but I know like even in Pakistan, Wiki Islam, uh, which is uh, run by EXMNA, ex-Muslims in North America, uh, that's blocked. So we created a mail, mail website, so it's Wiki Islamica. Net. I mean, um, that was quite quick to set that up. But a lot of the other um, websites are blocked, you like. And so that's one of my challenges too. Like I'm on YouTube, so I don't know if um, I don't know if I'm blocked in any way from any of the countries. Uh, if YouTube is blocked, but like I try to upload my videos on on um, I try to upload my videos on Facebook as well, just as a backup. Uh, but yeah, it, it is a challenge, constant like uh, whack-a-mole type of game you have to play to get your content out there. And especially to non-English speaking, uh, non-English speaking audience. I've been trying to get my videos subtitled into Somalia, Somali language. And oh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's nice. Is that what it looks like? Is that the official... Uh, is that the official screen you see, like um, when when a website is blocked? I'm guessing that's just a parody of, of some of them. Uh, I think oh, stops, yeah, stops, it looks stops a little bit silly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it looks silly. Stops um, into his hops. <laughs> okay. Can you share from your um, introverted smiles? Are you also in Canada, or are you from the US? Oh, I'm definitely in the US. US. Can you two guys share for us what what it's like? over there as ex-Muslims for you and do you is there any threats are you able to openly speak in both the US and Canada what are, what is it like for you guys well in the US um, we have uh, 13 chapters now uh, the ex-Muslims of North America so very happy about that I think it's it's still taboo here in the US uh, we definitely have more freedoms than people in the UK people in the UK for being ex-Muslim uh, there's a lot of violence uh, that goes on uh, people get jumped get beat up uh, over in the US uh, I'm sure if you just say you're ex-Muslim or you know my video spread to people here locally where I live I live in Florida it's more of like a taboo and you get shunned and people don't want to interact with you but it's nothing hostile uh, I would say in the US I, I think you'll be fine you can go about your life uh, just stay away from the Muslim crowd uh, uh, like a I want to say, actually, I take that back. I don't want to say stay away from the Muslim crowd, but there are some Muslims that'll just have a problem with you. But um, I still have Muslim friends and family, you know. I just can't really be totally open about it and argue back. That's it. So, wow. so for me, yeah, so for me, I, I pretty much have the same thing to say. I didn't even know you were an EXMNA uh, intro. Anyways, for um, for me in Canada, like. Okay, so I'm a huge. So first of all, I don't I don't mention specifically where I'm, where in Canada I am. I try to avoid getting into that. Like people know people who know me know where I am, so that's not an issue. But just I'm just being on the safe side because um, obviously you know it's there's some risk involved in doing what I do, and I don't want anyone in my family getting hurt. If not necessarily even hurt, it could be less than that. It could be something, you know, they can like create trouble for you in different ways. So anyways, I won't get into that. Um, but yeah, to, um, 
to answer your question, it's a similar experience. The Muslim community just acts kind of like awkward around me. And it's like an elephant in the room. It's like your your dad died or something and they don't wanna they don't know what to say to you. And sometimes there's a weird half salams you get where they start saying salam and then they stop and then they don't know what to say and then like, hey, how's it going? Hey buddy, like like you're now a white boy. Hey buddy, how's it going? Like instead of salam alaikum. And sometimes they'll still say salams and anyways, it's it's just a lot of awkwardness. But um, to your face, they don't usually say anything. They're just like, especially if they know you, like they knew you for your whole life and they saw that you were sincere and now they're just like confused, right? Like mostly they feel sad for you and they're just depressed. And I had a couple of people start crying when they were talking to me, like my auntie and my sister-in-law instead of crying, you're going to go to hell and all that nonsense. But, you know, unfortunately, I almost started laughing both times this happened because I just found it so ridiculous that you're crying for me to go to an imaginary hell that you believe in that I'm going to be tortured in forever and ever but it just seems so silly to me that it's like it's like a kid crying because Santa Claus is not coming and you know you just feel like you feel sorry for them like like they're so upset but it's not it's not real right in the first place so yeah that's my experience same as same as intro it's it's pretty safe I think in Canada for me for the most part I'm just you know just taking some precautions just in case but for the most part I actually got recognized in public twice and both times it kind of freaked me out because it was like someone came up to me and is like, are you Abdullah Samir? And I'm like, um, depends who's asking, like, why do you want to know, right? Like that. I was like, but then I'm like, yeah, it's me. And they're like, oh, cool. I watch your videos and I'm thinking about what you said and this and I'm like, oh, right, cool, cool. And I'm like, see you later. And I just, you know, took off. <laughs> And that's exactly it. Rationalizer once told me about this. He said I was walking through Birmingham and I was on the side of the road and I saw a, a, like just a normal guy. You know, he, he was just wearing this typical Islamic dress. So he was obviously a Muslim on the other side of the road. And he was looking at him. And he said, at that moment in time, I decided I need to go anonymous because it's really, I don't know this guy, but he was looking at me and he was really like checking me out. And he thought to himself, does he know me? Is this now something that, um, th that I need to be careful of? And this is when he said, it's exactly what you are saying. There is some risk involved in what he does. And that's when he had decided no longer to give out like address and things like that. Yeah, it yeah, happens like, a little bit here as well. I'll post something in the chat here. There's another gentleman that, that a number of Muslims hate, and I'll put it here as well. Uh, he's an African gentleman that um, is in Speaker's Corner. His name is Sara, S-A-R-A. -A. And if you follow the link there, you'll, you'll see some videos of him interacting with Muslims and, and a couple of threats being made there. So there are a few threats in. And again, this is a small minority of sort of more, um, I, I would say, less psychologically stable Muslims in a sense, um, not, not a lot of them. So it's not like there's a big thing going on necessarily, but this is ex this is not even ex-Muslims. These are, he's very blunt with his, his criticism of, of Muhammad being a pedophile, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if somebody asks me, I'll say that, but I'm not running around saying it left, right and center. So he's very much more a case of being in your face. Um, and he's a little bit infamous over here or famous, depends on your point of view. And so there is a little bit of that, that going on, especially in Speaker's Corner where people come regular. So you kind of know people. You know, I, I'll shake Ali Dawa's hand, for example, that sort of thing. Um, I've been out to dinner with him, et cetera, and, and other Muslims. So uh, again, and I think Stops kind of said it. I'm sure he did. If he hasn't, he said it on other shows. We don't hate any Muslim, but I, I do. I'm very critical of the ideas and the ideology. And I know there's good Muslims because I'm speaking to them regularly as well. So again, and I think you guys would say the same and so would people like Harris and all the rest. But some people, the more, quote, famous you get, the more people want to uh, misrepresent your petition, uh, position and say, yeah, you hate all Muslims or you want to do a nuclear first strike or some other nonsense like that. And I think any, most of us are clear that we don't actually hate almost any Muslims. That's just a negative emotion that you don't really want to, to have in your life if you can possibly help it. Um, and But we are critical of an ideology and that's the difference. And of course, that's what some very liberal people just don't get that message. They equate it with bigotry and this made up term Islamophobia, when in fact, all we're talking about is, is an ideology. Well, Rob, I have a question for you. In the UK, you know, specifically Speaker's Corner around that area, is there um, any hostility towards Muslims that, you know, you approach, you approach those type of people and have to talk them out of it and tell them it's the ideology, it's not the people, or is it pretty much safe for the most part? 
Are you talking about Muslims confronting ex-Muslims or who, who are they? Um, I'm talking about like uh, people who just have a hatred for Muslims straight out. I mean, I just want to know if they're public out there in the UK around oh, that area. Like, so you mean like far right people potentially or people who have like the ideology that all Muslims are bad or terrorists. That's very yeah. rare. Some people will, there will be the odd person who goes through there. I mean, it's, it's majority Muslims in Speaker's Corner, 70%, I would suggest at least. Uh, it, it's a by like, so it's on a Sunday for people who don't know. Every Sunday in Hyde Park in London, you can, if you go onto Google Maps and you type in Speaker's Quarter, Hyde Park, London, you will get the spot where you know, we all congregate. You'll see it in videos. Um, and so it's majority Muslims. And it sort of starts maybe 10, 11 o'clock. And by, say, 2 o'clock in the afternoon until about 5, 6, 7 o'clock in the evening, that's when there's a couple of hundred people at least. Um, and so people will wander past that have never been there. And you'll get the odd person who's very critical of Islam and may even say, you Muslims are bombers or you this, that, and the other. And, of course, that attracts Muslims over. And you'll get people that are very keen Muslims, they're very keen to portray that they're not like that. And of course, we that have looked into this know that most Muslims are not like that. Um, but then again, Pew polls do show different degrees of um, conservatism, shall we say, from, you know, the small subset of terrorist bombers, as Harris has said, and, and that circle widens out. But no, it's, it's, it's very rare. And I've never had to pull somebody away and go, hey, you shouldn't be saying that. It's, it's rare that you know, you get a member of the public just coming and shouting, all oh, you Muslims are bombers and, you know, to go into that extreme. But there will be people who will um, really, on occasion, shout. And there's a one great one. I'll find you the link while, while you guys talk. But there's a there's a one that's got 1.8 million hits now for the British guy that I know personally there in, in Speaker's Corner who's doing a bit of red uh, because it's a Muslim who starts it. And so he, he responds. And I'll find the link. You guys will think it's amusing. The channel doesn't have many videos, but somehow this video went viral. So... Um, you'll be able to see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because thank you for answering that question. Because uh, I, definitely, when I was Muslim, I used to be terrified of the Pamela Gellers or Robert Spencers. And you know, I look at them now as an ex-Muslim. Like they make a lot of sense. You know, I used to be terrified of, you know, these type of people that I created in my mind that actually didn't exist, or it might be the oddball. And I think Muslims need to understand that uh, to take away this fear that they have uh, when it comes to engaging with people about their religion. Yeah, I think you, I agree. And you, you'll get some Muslims who will just paint Pamela Geller or Robert Spencer or Tommy Robinson, whoever it may be, as just racist, bigoted Islamophobes. And that now puts them into a corner. You know, when you throw shit, it, it's difficult to uh, wipe it off. It sticks easily and it's hard to get off. And so instead of dealing with the criticism, say, hey, Tommy Robinson said this, here's why he's wrong. Now that's a way to deal with it. But when you just attack the person's character, as we know, um, that's, there's no substance, but that gets into the media. It sounds good because some Muslims, not all, um, can't really deal with the arguments. And so it's easier just to smear somebody. So I would want to see Muslims challenge their ideas, show us where this wrong. Or if you're saying they're bigoted or racist or Islamophobia, show me something specific they said that I can agree with or not. But otherwise, you're just making claims. And it's like, it's like but then they mustn't be upset when people make claims about their prophet or about them. Because if they're going to do the same, then they've got to expect it. And that's something maybe we can talk about as well as kind of the free speech thing that's really been a little bit under scrutiny now in Speaker's Corner. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what's happening? What's this free speech thing you're talking about? There's issues now? Yeah, so again, there's a <coughs> been, it's been going on a little bit for a while now. Um, Sara, the, the, the guy that I put into that link, he's, he's obviously quite vociferous in Speaker's Corner. And what it does is it challenges... Muslims and theists in general, and j even just people who don't have a psychological understanding of what happens in a conversation. So I've done a little bit on psychology, uh, particularly in, in focusing on intimate relationships, but I understand the model. And so when somebody's insulted, essentially, you know, you hear something which you interpret to have a meaning, you then have a negative feeling, and you now have a response based on this whole process. But it happens in an instant, uh, and so now you feel insulted. But in fact, and we, we could do a show on this really, is people are, fee are choosing to feel insulted. And once I can, and this is not my opinion, I will show you how this is guaranteed to be the case. And if it is the case that people choose, in, a, in a inverted commas, to feel insulted, now the whole thing changes. Because imagine you go to somebody and they say, um, Abdul, I, I feel insulted that you said something about the prophet. Uh, and my response, if they were open to it, would be, okay, so I'd explain it. And then I would say to them, you know, are you, how, for how long are you going to choose to feel insulted? Because, whoa, now it's their choice. The moment you throw in the word choose, now it's no longer your fault. It's them choosing to feel this way. And so that's the psychology that I want to 
educate people in because then you can inoculate yourself against the so-called you know, in, insult and, and offense. And so this is what's been happening in Speaker's Corner. Of course, people are insulting the prophet. Um, and so some Muslims are not all and probably the minority. Um, well, I think a fair amount of Muslims feel insulted, but there's a, a small minority that now gets very vocal and on occasions it's spilled over with threats. So they, they haven't actually been fisticuffs, but there have been threats, etc., against certain non-Muslims often by Muslims, started by Muslims. Now, Sarah did actually threaten somebody, but that was after this guy had said things that they put his name online, his his wife's name. And, and you're right, that's why you guys, even he's a, he's not even a Muslim. He's not even an ex-Muslim. But there is a few people, and again, not everybody, of course, but there's a few Muslims that have gone to look for for him or for his family, etc. And so he got upset and went back and sort of threatened the Muslim that had originally originally threatened him. And so that part's caught on camera. And so there's been a few incidents like that. I caught one on camera where he was threatened by another Muslim. I've also got a, a part where that Muslim came to me and suggested that I had edited the video in a way to make him look bad, which of course, it doesn't take any editing to make him look bad. And so I, of course, put the full video up um, for him because I'd done it in a way to separate the two videos uh, in, a, in an innocent way because there was a debate going on, two people were having a debate. Then Sarah came over and sort of said a few things. And then this other Muslim came over and listened to Sarah and then Sarah was again, um, they were saying that his buddy was a pedophile, so he claimed Muhammad was a pedophile. The Muslim got upset and started threatening Sarah and had to be pulled away. And so I split up the- I'm gonna the bash videos. your face in. Yeah, I'm gonna smash your face in. So I had two videos. One was the debate, because I knew that the altercation is gonna be everybody's focus. So I went, okay, let me split these two videos up so that one, people can focus on the debate. Number two, those who wanna look at the altercation and have an opinion can do that. And so I split these two up, but I made them overlap. So it wasn't like I specifically went into the altercation video and, ooh, let me just edit it in such a way that a particular person looks bad. In fact, I, I just pushed it back to sort of 10 or 20 seconds to give people a chance. So if you've watched the first part, then you go and watch the second part and there'll be a bit of overlap. But this guy approached me and basically said I was editing it. But he had already made up his mind. So he's not somebody that I take seriously as, as any sort of person who's thinking rationally. Uh, and so I've now put the entire video up. But there is a little bit of this undercurrent of there, there's a little bit of sort of bully boy tactics in the sense of they're going around there trying to those people that they don't like or they've already pre-decided. And again, this is not everybody. I want to keep stressing that. Um, and so there's a little bit of, you know, we're kind of running the park. They're not saying those words, but that's the kind of intimation that's coming out uh, when, of course, that's not the case. I wanted to say, like, um, about what you were just saying that I feel like you know, the wall, Muhammad is a pedophile kind of argument. And, uh, you know, in the chat, someone's saying child rapist. I don't, I don't find that, you know, bringing that argument is productive. Like, it, it's not productive, in my opinion, in my you're right. personal no, no, You're right, yeah. It just, it just shuts down the argument. It just shuts you down right now. Like, I was talking to a guy that had a debate. Like, I'm trying to get someone to debate with me or discuss with me, like I told you. And this one guy, um, he his name is Rahmatullah Navruz, and he debated Mufassil Islam, and he said he got so pissed, he just, I mean, he didn't say pissed, but he, he basically hung up after five minutes. He got so annoyed with him. And I, I don't find, like, that's the way to kind of reach people, the, the, the biggest chunk. I mean, that's one style for sure. Mufassil Islam style, like, you know, put on the, the boxing gloves and like, boom, boom, boom. But like, you know, in general, human nature will tell you that people will get, you know, they'll just become defensive and they'll start, they'll stop listening to you. So, you know, in my videos, I actually, I go so far that, that I actually say, you know, Prophet Muhammad, like I actually mentioned, Prophet Muhammad said, even though I don't believe he's a prophet, and sometimes I don't say Prophet Muhammad, sometimes I just say Muhammad, but I don't, I don't call him Mo for the most part. Like sometimes I, I do feel like being rude and antagonistic, especially when people are being nasty to me. But you know, I have my own morality, my own values. I don't, I don't need to lower myself to someone else's standards because they're being, you know, like a loser. I don't need to become a loser too, right? So I try, to, I try to maintain the upper hand always. The, you know, maintain my ground, maintain my values, and not get into mudslinging. Um, that's that's challenging because. Um, you know, it happens sometimes that they piss you off, right? And, but like, I try not to, to get to that. And I, I, I'm trying, I want, you know, the goal, what's my goal? My goal is to reach as many people as possible, to get them to think, to get them to open their minds and their hearts and to, to see that Islam is actually not true, right? So the best way to do that is by not building, you know, like these mental barriers and helping them to see that you're not here to, you know, like to attack, but to, you know, to dialogue, right?
Yeah, and I want to ask you real quick, like let's say if you got a YouTube comment and uh, you have a picture of uh, Muhammad being old and a young Aisha girl and his he has an erection in that picture, even if he comes with the most rational arguments in that comment, yeah, you can argue that um, y you know he came with rational arguments and you need to tackle that. But at the same time, if for a Muslim's mind, he's just going to shut you off completely because they think you have these hateful preconceived notions of Islam. The reality is, is that Muslims are sensitive towards their belief. Yeah, everybody, everybody has like, I mean, that's human nature, right? And I, I think the other thing too is we need to be more precise, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like we need to use our language more carefully and we need to pick our arguments better too. So instead of saying Muhammad is a rapist or, you know, a pedophile or whatever, I don't say those things. What I, what I will say though, is I have a big problem with the fact that the Quran allows you to marry a young girl. And like, I, and I give my evidence for that, you know how the Quran says that the waiting period um, for a woman who has not yet menstruated is, you know, there's a waiting period for her. And so that that's the evidence that, you know, even if you married someone that doesn't have, a, that hasn't reached puberty, you can still sleep with her. Otherwise there would be no waiting period because if you didn't sleep with her, the Quran says there's no waiting, waiting period, right? So, um, yeah, so so basically, um, what I, I you know I use arguments like that. I use arguments like you know another recent recently I was thinking about it that you know another thing you can say is a child cannot meaningfully consent to to sex basically that right? a child cannot consent a slave cannot meaningfully give consent. So like you know these are better arguments than just like and you know the other thing too is. It's not a reason not to do it, but like, you know, people are very sensitive about Muhammad even more than Allah. And, you know, it tends to be that attacking Muhammad can get you killed much more easily because it just raises a lot of anger and tension. And I had a friend who made a video uh, and he made a video talking about the Isra wal Miraj, the, the night ascension of Muhammad. And it, it was actually a really funny video. I watched it and I thought it was quite comical. He made like a he made it like a story where there's a bouncer at the gates, and as he goes up, he's like, "Yo, man!" And he's talking to all the prophets, and the prophets are like, "He made it like a funny story, but like he actually got death threats, and he had to actually take his video down, or he actually made it unlisted. He got he got death threats in real life, not like me, like just online. Like people that know him actually threatened him, not not death threats, but like." They threatened, they threatened him, right? And they, they said like, we're gonna, t you know, he heard from someone else that they're gonna like beat him up or something. And and he lives in uh, in the US, right? I wouldn't say we're in the US, but like, you know, so it, it, had the, it has the opposite effect that you're looking for. So now he doesn't make any videos. He has to be a little bit more anonymous than he was before. Like, it's just like, it creates more problems, right? When you when you have that approach, I think, and like I, I don't want to, I don't blame Mufassal Islam at all because I know that he had some issues in his life. He lost his mom. His mom doesn't talk to him. His wife, he lost, you know, his wife left him. He can't see his kids. Like he has so many problems in his life that were caused by Islam. Who's this guy? Mufassal Islam. Yeah. What about him? Details or links that we can have a look at his stuff. Who is this? Yeah, 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 sure. He actually interviewed me. Um, he's a Bengali atheist. He actually, he's really, very, very popular. Um, like, like when he posted my video, I got oh, like... this is the guy. Okay, sorry, I, got I like, didn't know him under that name. I got like, I think a hundred friend requests after he posted my video or something. Like, it was like, boom, 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 like friend request, friend request. I just got like, so, like, he's quite popular and... I don't know if he was he talks a scholar. And talks and talks. That's, that's it. Yeah. I, I get so annoyed with him because after a while, I mean, at the beginning, I actually subscribed. Then I thought, no, come on. I mean, he just rambles on and on and on. And I said, no, I don't have time for this. Yeah, yeah. His style, he has his own style. So, yeah, a lot of people don't like his approach. He gets a lot of views, though. Um, I'm, I'm checking his videos that are like a year old. He's got like 30, 40,000 views on it. Uh, the thing is, he spent a majority of his life defending Islam, so I think that's why he's so angry. Uh, he he's on the Islam channel, and he just he he communicates with people like all over the world about Islam. So I think that initial anger phase is still there. A lot of people like it. A lot of people don't like it. He's very bipolar uh, in his fans. Yeah, and I think it's a case of, um, you know, different people will be attracted to different styles, and so I'm sure he's helped people 
we will help people in our different styles like stops and i have slightly different approach and, and somebody's actually said you know what stops was quite hard on me but actually was good for me and so his approach would work for some people and i think that's the other thing to recognize but i wanted to go back to something you said abdullah and maybe there's a different perspective because what i understood and correct me if i'm wrong is you, you kind of intimated that okay there's a certain style that we shouldn't approach some or maybe all muslims or the majority of muslims with which is the sort of insulting style now for me personally, that's not my approach either, but I do recognize that other people have got that approach. And, and I, I would offer you a perspective to consider, which is um, if we allow Muslims to, and again, not all Muslims, I will always say that, but if we allow certain Muslims to um, dictate the narrative in the sense of um, they're going to get angry, they're going to make threats, and so we're going to back down or whoever's going to back down, um, what, in my view, having done some coaching and, and training on this sort of behavior, what it allows is for the perpetrator, if I can use that term, it says to them it's okay to carry on this negative behavior. And from my point of view, I want to show somebody that that negative behavior is not tolerable or not acceptable, and it doesn't even help them. But obviously they're not in, in any state to be aware of that. But for us to back down, now it's not going to insult everybody left, right, and center, but it, what I would rather have is not us going down to the lowest standard but rather rising all the ships together so my my solution is an education and it's in particular a psychological education and teaching people particularly some muslims that uh, number one being insulted or offended is an illusion it's not true i know you think it's true but if we unpack it and we gave you a course and we explained it to you you would be in no doubt that in fact you are making the choice now in order to solve that in order to get out of that take some time it's not going to happen overnight tomorrow suddenly you never offended again i mean it's possible i could probably get offended It'd be rare but it would but immediately yeah. i recognize that it's my choice now okay. i don't necessarily figure it out in that moment but it is my choice when i go and reflect on it correct okay so i should clarify what i mean um i because yeah you hear this all the freaking time for muslims why do you have to go and offend my religion? Where, don't you have better morals than that? Why do you have to offend people? Mm. Why do you have to insult me? Why do you have to insult my religion? Like, you know, I don't insult your religion. The Quran says, don't talk badly about other gods. Well, hold on there, buddy. Your Quran actually calls, you know, disbelievers filth. Okay, najis. So don't let them approach Masjid al-Haram ever after that. Oh no, that's spiritual filth. Okay, so your Quran calls people spiritual filth. Okay, fine. That's the first thing. Second of all, you, like it's just full of insults. It's it's completely full of insults towards like the worst of all animals. Yeah, like worse than animals, deaf, dumb, and blind, and this and that, and it goes on and on and on and on. So why do you think your Quran is put on a pedestal and you know it can say whatever you can promote that and it can say whatever it wants and I can't I can't make fun of your religion. I can't say that this doesn't make any sense. Like, I don't agree with that. And I do I do believe that mocking has its purpose, right? If you're just mocking for the sake of ego and just to make yourself feel good, then you're not a good person. And you're not, you know, may not have the best effect, right? Because you're just doing it for your own ego and you just want to put the other person down. But like, if you're doing it, like kind of like, you know, when Ali Dawa goes online and he goes and he's actually making fun of people like for doing things that they're not supposed to do in Islam, like, you know, picks on women, for example. What what is what is the point of doing that? It's just to make yourself look good and feel good, right? So um, go ahead, Rob. You have a slide you want to show us. I just want to, I, I won't go into very much depth, and I have done this elsewhere, but I'll just show you this. So this is what we call the NLP communication model, and essentially this is an unpacking of what happens when what they call an external event comes in. So if you look over here, so somebody says something, you know, Muhammad is a pedophile, whatever. That's an external event. It's an audio auditory uh, event that comes into somebody's system, and it gets filtered through these sort of filters. Again, I could do a much more in-depth, you know, uh, analysis of this for you. Uh, and based on these filters, which are often um, through our social conditioning, our upbringing, etc., it goes in and it gets, it, it, you get, you um, have an internal representation. So somebody says something. And remember that this, we can, we can show that this is not objective because everybody will have a different internal representation. It then affects your state. That that's how you, your body is, your, your, your feelings, etc. It affects your psychology and then it's your behavior. And so if we can, at this point here, have an education that says, hey, you can change this part, then this will change and so will everything else. And I think that for me in like 10 seconds is really just the, um, the way that one can, can overcome 
these sort of things, which is, you know, just educating people that it's that it's okay, um, or, or should I say it's, that it's not okay to feel insulted. It's just something that you've learned. Other people around you do it, but in fact, it's an illusion. It's, it's a bit like, and the analogy is not perfect, but it's, it's a bit like believing Santa Claus. Young children believe it, and then eventually they get to a point where nobody else believes it. They look around, they ask some questions, and they find out, hey, it doesn't actually exist. But all the time up until that point, they, they thought it was real. Uh, and it's the same with, and I think being offended and being insulted is insidious. It's, it's in, in some sense worse than some of the other things that are going on because it's affecting our society and people are pandering to it because they don't have an education that in fact, this is just an illusion for the person, even though it feels real objectively to the rest of us, it's illusory. And going through this whole process, I think is helpful for those who are interested to show that we can unpack this and show you that what's going on can be changed and it's just your subjective opinion based on certain criteria that's giving you this. And if then you have that education, you now have to be asked how long you're gonna to choose to feel this way. And once that question is asked of you, now you have to take responsibility and it's no longer the person that says something to you, it's all about you. And I think that's what the education process should be, which is, hey, it's all about you instead of me trying to change the other person's behavior because I don't really have control over them anyway, unless I'm going to threaten them or do something to modify their behavior. So rather, can I inoculate myself against it, which is what I've said to Muslims. Hey, Sarah is actually your greatest gift. Now, most Muslims wouldn't really understand that even if I explained it, that he's your greatest gift. You can deal with Sarah, the, the guy at Speaker's Corner, man, now you've got armor to deal with people because they, people like Sora are not going to go away. Now, I may not, as I say, go with his approach, but he should have the right and show so to anybody else. And somebody can come and say whatever they like to me, I've got to be able to deal with it in an empowering way for me because I can't stop them without, you know, some kind of threat or some kind of insidious thing that I'm going to tell them to change their behavior. I, I mm -hmm. think uh, I just want to share real quick. I think there are a lot of Muslims in America, at least, that do play in with the PC culture, politically correct. Uh, because when I used to do uh, response videos to American Muslims, and I would tackle it point by point, Quran and Hadith only, and I would get messages immediately saying, "Take down your video. You're um, creating a crowd that hates Islam and hates Muslims. Therefore, this is a threat." And they would get away with it. They would report it to YouTube have my videos taken down and i think that's a little too sneaky a little too slimy i mean i've seen ali dawa for example do worse on camera exactly all stops about his channels go ahead stops i mean no i'm not going to cry in public <laughs> not much fine, but just so that people know that it's not just introverted it's happening all over the show but it's only happening on one side of the the scale so to speak okay i mean they're closing down the gin and tonic show of all things, I mean, really, I mean, how can how can a podcast where people are talking about something, we're not insulting, we're, we're just discussing Islam, and we're talking about the facts, we're looking at the history, we're looking at the sources, we're looking pre-Islamic, we're, we're looking at the geography, we're looking at different things, but never, never, ever, ever, in any way are we going and saying, this is the, the, the Muhammad is an asshole. No, we don't do that. And they close it down because it's too uncomfortable for them to bear with the truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. And uh, this type of like sneaky censorship is will lead to more, you know, far right intolerance and hatred, you know, because if you can't have legitimate discourse, then, you know, things just tend to explode, right? We need to support, um, you know, people's people being able to, especially like you said, like, why would you, you know, shut down the gin and tonic show? That's ridiculous. Uh, but I guess people feel sad. And, and it happens to the other side too, like uh, this guy, Asadullah Ali, who is a, he's a kind of Islamist living in Malaysia. And uh, he had someone tell him, this someone is Eddie from the Dean show. I don't know if you guys know him. Anyways, he told him, <laughs> talk he told he told uh, Asadullah to talk to me because Asadullah is an ex atheist as well, <laughs> ex atheist. So, um, what happened was uh, introverted. I'm hearing myself on your speakers. I just needs to mute himself, I think, or you mute him if he's not around. Let me mute. Let me mute him. Uh, yeah. So, like I was saying, um, ah, okay, then I muted him. Uh, yeah. So, like I was saying, um, <laughs> what was I saying? 
What were we talking? Are you talking about this ex-Muslim? Yeah, sorry, ex-atheist? Yeah, yeah, so Asadullah, okay, he eventually ended up blocking me, but this guy, he has a channel as well, and he also has the same type of things being done to him, where he's, he's promoting, like, Islamic values, Islamist values, like Islamic state, you know, at one point death to apostate, stuff like that, and he's also being censored by people, you know, reporting his channel, and so I, I think this kind of stuff happens all over the board. Uh, what where it's the most insidious is when you have a government like Pakistan working with the company, an American company like Facebook, to like shut down like atheist pages and pages insulting insulting Muhammad and like you know like big atheist pages like Atheist Republic and like. Like these pages got shut down sometimes, it, you know, some of them came back up, some of them didn't. Like you said, gin and tonic show. So that's that's where it gets really insidious, right? Eh? Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of, that is definitely a concern for, for me. What, what is your guys, how threatened they feel? I'm sorry? It shows you how threatened they feel. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Rob, there was something you wanted to ask me. You said you disagreed with something in my atheist video. What was that? I just, atheist. I don't know if I did. I wanted to clarify really with you. Because when, when you talked about the atheist video, you seem to suggest that, that we have, in some sense, uh, human beings have an innate disposition. Uh, I thought you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what is your view on, do, do, do you view like the fitra or a version of that? Do you think human beings in general have an innate belief in either a god or something supernatural, or maybe you can clarify what, what your right. view is. I, I had a feeling, like I was thinking, what what is he going to ask me about in from that video? And, and somehow I thought, you know, he's going to ask me about that. So that's good. Yeah, no, I don't think it's like an innate. So, you know, we have a lot of, let's call them biases based on uh, evolutionary history. One of the biases that we know about is that we tend to favor, you know, helping small groups we, we feel more sympathy for small groups or individuals over larger groups of people so if you see an ad with like one little girl you know that's like starving you you know they've done studies and people are like let's say willing to donate like 50 bucks or something then you know you show them like two people now it's like dropped to like 20 bucks and yeah, then you show like a wall yeah and then you show like a whole crowd of like a thousand people that just died in an earthquake like, um, is it time for dinner yet? Like, this news is kind of uh, depressing. I gotta, I gotta go, it's dinner time, see you later. So it's like, you know, we have certain biases. The other bias we have is towards, you know, sugar and fat. And so, you know, for whatever reason, you know, there's many things about our mind, um, just the way like we have dreams. And so one of the things that I do think is that it's, it's much easier to believe in God. Not that there's a fitra to believe in God, but it's just it's just instinctive. It's just like you know you kind of it's kind of like the the God to me is like a super ego. It's like you have your ego, and God is like the ultimate projection of your ego. You know what I mean? You 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 whatever you need. You know you need you want to live forever. You want to go to paradise. You want to be reunited with your family members. You want God to take care of your kids when you die. You want God to take care of your parents when they're sick. You know you're praying to God. It's it's like ultimate super ego. And, and I do believe that if you look at the history of humanity, like, for whatever reason, we've always tended to, maybe because we couldn't explain things any better, we always tended to believe in a God. And, I, and, and so I feel, you know, coming from the perspective of, you know, kind of like design in nature and stuff like that, it's just much easier to believe in God. I always believe this, and even to this day as an atheist, I just think you'll never have a majority of people being atheists because I just think it's much more complicated to come to that conclusion. I do believe... There is no God, and I do believe that is a correct conclusion. I just don't think it's an easy conclusion. And I think it's much more difficult to understand, you know, the world and everything in it without using, you know, without resorting to God did it. You know what I'm saying? So that was kind of, yeah, that's kind of how I see it. And and just the fact that, you know, humans in history have always, you know, turned to some sort of belief in some sort of supernatural deity, whether it was nature or whether it was um, idols or whether it was some abstract. And, you know, humans have gone through different phases throughout a, um, a history of belief. And now, you know, it seems like atheism is, is becoming much more popular or agnosticism or whatever. But yeah, that's, that's, that's my clarification. Okay, cool. Because, you know, there is studies that came up the other day, I think I posted in one of my shows a, a little while back. Um, there is a correlation with, uh, with education and, and non-belief. And so the more educated a society, generally speaking, the less they believe in supernatural entities. Um, but going right. back to what you were talking about, 
I would s submit to you that we are all born atheists. And the only reason, and if you look at very, very young children, we're not talking about children that once they get to sort of two and a half, three, when they can understand and talk, et cetera, then they start taking on the beliefs of their parents or their society or whatever the case is by that stage. And there's always these, these um, and Stops will know this, and he did it long before I did, but there, there's, there's this claim by some Muslims about the innate fitra. And of course, when you look into it, those studies are not what they're saying. At best, at best, and these are people that studied from three-year-olds upwards, um, they believe in like superhuman things. They believe their mom can do things that um, we know humans can't do. And that's just because they don't have a greater knowledge of the world and the limitations of, of humans. But my claim would be that we are born atheists. The moment you come out of your mother's womb, you do not have a connection to, well, let's say which God, because that would be stops his question, I'm sure. Maybe he's asking in the background, well, which God? You know, when you say a God, what God? Is it a God that, that wrote a book and told people what to do? Is it a deistic type of God? Because I will say to you this, by the way, just because I'm a fairly strong atheist, but I will say to you that I have read a, a, um, an account of God, and I've talked about this on my show before, which is coherent. And were that God to exist, I would actually want to have a relationship. Now, that might sound strange to you. Um, and I would encourage you, if you get a chance, read Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh. Just the first three books, or even just the first book, Neil Donald Walsh, Conversation with God. He, he wrote them in late 90s. Uh, he had a, he, you know, his claim is that he had a conversation with a God, and he started writing on a piece of paper. Uh, and he got responses. He wrote an entire book, word for word, as it sort of came through him, so to speak. Now, all of us would go, okay, you know, how do we know it's not his imagination? And we don't know. But if that imaginary, let's call it for the moment, God existed, if you go and read the book, his questions, the, the answers that came back, and I met him in person before I became sort of more of a staunch atheist, just a normal guy. So he's not one of these guys that claims to be a guru or anything like that. But that version of a God, which is unconditionally loving, which has various other attributes that one can talk about, overcomes all of the negativity that I would associate if a God existed, you know, the Abrahamic God exists. All of those problems are gone in that version. So I went, wow, if there was a God, I could accept that God. Whereas if there was a God in, in Islam, I, I would have to accept it if there was overwhelming evidence, but I'd be, it would be a bone crushing to, to find out that that was true. I'd be, oh my God, you know, if that's a God, you know, then I, I could be a better God. Give me the power and I, I would be better than, you know, the Islamic God. So there is a version of this, but I don't think that people are born with a connection to a God because A, there's too many of them. So how do they know which one? Um, and it's only through indoctrination or socialization that they actually start to believe it. And as you, as we've said, and again, it's easy to look up, the more educated a, a society, the less reliant they are on supernatural or superhuman things. So for me, I, I don't see it that that's in the natural state. And all we need to, to, um, to falsify this is to find a, a group of people that are untouched externally to the, 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 the wider world who have atheistic beliefs. And what do you know? The, the pariah people of, of Amazon are exactly like that. They are essentially atheists. They were not interacted with the outside world. They had a priest, they, a priest went there to try and convert them. And they asked similar questions to us, although not maybe as technical. And they asked him, why did he believe, etc. And it turned out he became an atheist after having met this tribe. And the entire tribe only believes in what's around them. He says it's amazing people. They they have a, a wonderful life. This is a, a very primitive tribe, but they have no supernatural belief whatsoever. And, and it wasn't that they lost it because people came in and told them that's the way they evolved, if you want to call it that. So that's all we need from my point of view to put that view to one side. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting observation. And uh, pull ups mentioned in the um, ask, uh, ask him about a tribe in Brazil that will change your mind, the Piraha tribe. He said to ask you about it. That's the one. That's the one. Exactly the one. Yeah. Because that okay. brings us to the question: Why do we actually have religions? Why do we still have gods? And this is quite an amazing thing. Because, okay, the one thing is on on the one hand, we have this thing. This this, it's the comfort. Because if you do not know what is happening to you, if you are sick, if you have cancer, and you wonder why me, why am I getting this? Maybe it will go away. So you start thinking crazy things and you, and you start getting comfort and hope from something that does not exist. It's, it's like if you're in a, in, a, in, a, in a car and you are drowning in a river or something, you hope that Superman or Batman are going to come around, open up the car and rescue you because you are going to extremes at that moment in time because you are desperate. And this is why if you are lazy, 
or desperate, this is when you turn to gods. Because on the one hand, gods are an excuse to stop thinking. And then on the other hand, you start praying to things which you don't know, thinking that it's going to, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm going to win the lottery. Maybe it's something is going to happen that will improve my situation. And that is why we still have these religions. That's why we have these gods. It's just that, you know, if, if you look at all the claims that Muslims are making, if you look at all the things that they are saying about um, Barrett and, and, and um, I forgot her name now. They, Petrovich. And they, Petrovich. Go and they claim that they have done all this research. No, Petrovich. They, they don't do that. There is no research that has ever shown that children require gods. Never, ever, ever. It's just that it's wishful thinking. But we have the gods because it's much easier to stop thinking. It's much easier to say, oh, well, God is going to make me, you know, give me a new car or something like this. And then, lo and behold, some people do win the lottery and they say, you see, I told you it's true. So I, I'd be willing to reconsider my opinions. Uh, one thing that kind of seems unique about me is uh, not unique to me only, but I think people that are willing is, is a sign of an open mind is uh, the fact that I'm definitely willing to reconsider my opinion. So yeah, if that's the case, then maybe we are born atheist. I'd be willing to look into it. I'll, I'll check out that book. Thanks. Thanks, guys. But I don't think we're born atheist, by the way, because atheist has a very special meaning and very special contents of the word. So you can't be born as an atheist because you can't really contemplate what it means to be a theist to be an atheist. Good point. So, so, so if, if you, by the way, have you, do you guys know of Ozymandias Ramesses II? Uh, no. Go and watch those videos. He's, he's excellent. He's a, a philosopher. He goes into a great deal and he talks about this. In fact, people who don't know, here's an interesting thing for you, which I didn't know. Um, people who don't know a baby is not actually an atheist. You're quite right. I, I stand corrected stops. A baby is actually a non-theist. So a non-theist is somebody that has no understanding of what a God concept is. Whereas right. an atheist has a concept that has been sent to them or they've got sensory input that says, hey, here's the characteristics of a God. And we've evaluated that and gone, no, we don't believe that. We reject it. We don't know for certain. So we're not, we are not um, a Gnostic. In other words, we don't say, or well, most atheists don't say, hey, I know for certain, like maybe Aaron Ross, close to being you know, the very strong atheist, as you call it. He says, no, definitely doesn't exist. And I can show that. Now, I'm not quite in that position. I don't know for certain, but I believe that a God does not exist. And I reject the theist claim. So for me, I'm what some people might call a soft atheist, or if I give you the full title, agnostic atheist. But that's a whole different discussion. Um, but you're right. It's, so people who have never heard of the God's concept are non-theists. And those of us that have and have rejected that belief claim that's been given to us is an atheist. So you're right. Uh, babies would be a non-theist rather than an atheist. But look up yeah, Ozymandias sounds... Ramesses II. It's, it's very, he's got a, a lot of good stuff. Can you, yeah, we'll, I'll have to get that link I'll from you. And, um, yeah, that non, yeah, it sounds much, it sounds better to say babies are non-theists. I, I think that makes more sense than saying atheists. Saying that atheist sounds kind of funny to me. Yeah, okay. quite right. Um, so yeah, I would say that those people are non-theists, but let's put it this way, that I don't think anybody's born with a belief in, it, let, let's say, at the minimum, the Abrahamic gods. There may be a version oh, yeah, of that. Let's absolutely, say, yeah. No, no I, I, wouldn't even, I wouldn't even begin to claim that. <laughs> we don't know all the different gods. There may actually be one out there of the you know, hundreds or thousands that there are that is in fact true. Maybe it's the conversation with God, maybe it's something else. Um, but I'm pretty sure, or I have a high level of certainty in my belief rather than I know, that we aren't born with a belief in the Abrahamic gods, be it Christianity, Judaism, or Islam. And so from that point of view, I think we could say with a fair amount of certainty that um, we are non-theists when we're born. And, right. You know, yeah, but you're right. It's because we don't, if we were educated from the moment we were in the womb and we came out with some education of the natural world, I think then it would be unlikely that we would be looking to some kind of superhuman, supernatural entity because we'd have more of an understanding how thunder works, how rain forms, how the climate works, tectonic plates, whatever it is, we go, oh, we've got a natural explanation. I don't need to invoke something supernatural or superhuman to explain something that can, in fact, be explained naturally. Sort of a simple on the question. Other hand, if have... somebody did come, oh, sorry, intro, sorry, go. I just wanted to ask real quick uh, for you, uh, Stops and uh, Rob, did the Abrahamic narration of hell ever scare you guys, ever? No. <laughs> you, you always found it uh, funny or silly? That's yes, I did, in, in a sense that um, uh, because of the morality, because of the immorality of that, um, I've, 
I'm, I'm more certain that the hell doesn't exist than a God doesn't exist. And so I, I can't say with 100% philosophical certainty, but I would go to the 99% or the Richard Dawkins scale of 6.9 recurring that a hell doesn't exist. Because if it does, then that wouldn't be a God as I would define a God, which is you know, an unconditionally loving God. That's the minimum standard I require from a God that I would want to have any interaction with. He must be unconditionally loving, which immediately jettisons judgment and punishment. And so that that concept for me, but I do understand how theists would have that, you know, because that's been in, inculcated from a young age and there's this cosmic justice that a lot of us think we need. I, I don't necessarily, if Hitler, quote, got away with it, he got away with it in, in that sense. But a lot of theists that I come across have this innate, or they it seems to be innate, it's socially constructed, I would argue, belief or need for cosmic justice in case the drug dealer gets away with it or, you know, Stalin killed a billion people. He must, there must be some punishment that makes me feel better. You know, it's fine to feel better, but we don't believe that that's true. And so, yeah, I, I would, the, the belief in hell is just like so far out of my mind that it's, it couldn't possibly be the case. But again, the point yeah. that I was just trying to make, if somebody were to convince me, I would change my mind. Like if, if, if Jesus would now rise and say to me, look, I'm Jesus and here's the wine, or I don't know what he would have to do. I have no idea because I don't know what a God is. But then if a God were to present itself, were to manifest itself, there were arguments that would show me that this is not just another human being or an alien, but actually some sort of a God. I mean, any kind of technology that is advanced to mine, I would probably consider it to be a God. I would then change my mind. I would not worship this. And how do you guys feel? Would you change your mind and would you worship? Or would you also say, well, I mean, I have no choice but to accept it, but I would not worship. I was, yeah, scared I, out. I was scared out of my mind. Go ahead, Abdullah. <laughs> okay, no, you go ahead, actually. No, no, Tell I was just saying, I, I, you know, when back when I was a Muslim and a theist, like, I think that really made me stick with the religion, just the fear of the hellfire, and that happens with Muslims across the world. Yeah, you know what? Um, I think I was scared of, yeah, I was definitely scared of hell, too, uh, because I believed that Islam was true, and it was, you know, it was all real, and so to the point of like every little tiny thing i used to second guess myself and question myself it makes you ocd right like did i you know did i like let's say for example i walked out with an extra apple in the store right i'd be like oh my god like i have an extra apple right i used to think that like you know um some of them are really silly too like some of the examples <laughs> i'm almost embarrassed to say it like i used to tell people that like you know, they have Tim Hortons in Canada and they have this roll up the rim where you can win like prizes, like a car or something. So I used to tell people that, because this is what I was, what I was taught, that if you, if you buy that coffee with the intention of winning something, that's gambling. So you shouldn't gamble. You should buy the coffee with the intention of having a coffee, not because you want to win something. Like stuff like that, it just messes with your mind, right? So like, you know, every atom of evil you do, and it's like you, you you get scared, like every little thing, like, is this meat halal enough for me? You know, you have Muslims that are like, you know, we have two different types of halal meat here in Canada. And it used to be there was only hand slaughtered before, but then there's now machine slaughtered, right? Like this uh, Maple Lodge Farms, which is a big factory, they do meat and they now have halal meat, but they use a machine, right? And then you, now you have Muslims who are like scared it's not halal enough, right? Or you have Muslims that wear hijab, they're scared, they're not doing enough, they want to win the cob. So it's this constant fear that makes you do more and more and more. And I think this actually leads people to become terrorists as well, right? I mean, I'm not saying everyone's going to become a terrorist. Majority of Muslims will not become terrorists, but like, it's kind of like an insanely easy way out of the whole thing is just to like die for the sake of Allah. Cause, and I talked about that in my video, ISIS and Muslims about Jihad. And I talked about how, you know, it's just an easy, easy way to get out of the wall. Um, it's like a get rich quick scheme, right? You know, you got all these bills to pay. You got this big bill coming up and it's like, well, someone offered me like a million bucks if I just, you know, kind of like die for the sake of Allah. And I, I never used to believe that suicide bombing was halal. I used to think suicide bombing was considered like, like, like killing yourself and it was haram. But I did think that if, if there was like a legitimate jihad, you would go for it. And I used to think that maybe, maybe Palestine and Israel was like a legit kind of jihad. Um, you know, they're, they're oppressed or whatever. So I'm like, yeah, that's where I, I want to go. I want to go and die, you know, over there. So I think this, this whole fear of hell can lead to some kind of insane um, conclusions. 
and to make you kind of do some crazy things or maybe just give you some mental anxiety all the time. And I, I feel like I see some of my family members like that. The always, you know, worried about not doing enough good and the, the constantly feel guilty that they're not reading enough Quran, they're not praying enough, you know, salah, namaz, and they're not doing enough nafal and sunnah prayers, extra prayers on top of the prayers, on top of the five prayers, and they're not donating enough to the mosque and they're not donating enough to the poor people and they're not doing this enough and they're not doing that enough. And it's, it's like you can never win. It's like you, you can never be satisfied. You always have to do more and more and more and more and more. And I think this is kind of the mental, the, this is a problem with Islam. Islam and I don't know about religion in general, but specifically with Islam, this is a big problem. It gives you big time headaches, right? And it's like, especially if you're Salafi Muslim, and it's not only Salafis, even Sunnis in general, like everything is haram. Like it's like music is haram. Like you can't eat even the halal meat, like half the halal meat is not halal enough, right? And it's like, you know, it's like, what do you do? Like, how do you live your life? You can't go for Halloween. I couldn't take my kids for Halloween. I couldn't buy a house as a Muslim because of mortgage. So it's like you can you can never do enough for Allah, like apparently, except dying for the sake of Allah. That's a good way, like to get all your sins forgiven. But like other than that, it's like, you know, it's Allah is never happy, like no matter what you do, right? So it's like you go for Hajj once, it's not enough. You got to go for Hajj two times or three times. It's like, yeah, you, my sins were forgiven two years ago when I went for Hajj, but I got to do it again, right? And it's like, so I think that's the mental anxiety, not just the hell, but the. It's the wall, like everything in your life has to be judged and you're going to be like, it's going to be like a movie reel and everything is going to, you know, now I feel a little bit more peace of mind that like, you know, it's, I still have the same values that if I find a, let's say I find something on the train, I take the train to work, I find someone left an umbrella. I personally feel guilty taking that umbrella. I don't know why. Like, it's like the guy's not going to come back, but I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll go drop it at the lost and found. Not because I'm such a good person, but I don't know, for whatever reason, these, these morals, you know, they, we evolved with this altruism because I feel like this is what's good for humanity and this is what we evolved in because, it, it, you know, me helping you means you help me and we all thrive and we have a positive sum gain. So for whatever reason, whether, whatever evolutionary reasons, I have these values and wherever they came from, right? So maybe it's evolution, maybe it's a bit of upbringing, maybe it's a bit from Islam. And I have no problem saying I'm taking the good things from Islam because Islam does have some good things in it, just like Christianity and any other religion. Um, there's no, there's no harm in that, right? So, like, I feel like, yeah, the fear of hell thing now, it's like, hell is such a joke. It's like, it's not even funny. It's such a joke, like, such a joke. Like, it's, it's like, it's so ridiculous, the idea of hell. And I tell people that, that are scared of hell, like, just keep doing research, just keep learning, and you will see, like, Islam cannot be true. Like, once you find that out, you, there won't be any fear of hell. It'll just go away. I think you've made a very good point there, which is, um, if I summarize it in, in one way, at least, um, the foundation, the underpinning of the Abrahamic religions is one of fear, which is if I don't do X, Y and Z, I'm going to go to hell. Now, most people don't think of it in that way. But if you ask them questions and you dig down a little bit, you'll find that's what it is. It's, it's something you quite rightly said. Well, you don't, you know, and it's, and it's reciprocal altruism. It's the golden rule there's good reasons and we have got a moral system i'm i'm a believer in the moral landscape of, of sam harris where we can have objective it depends what we mean by objective moral standards without a god and even when you investigate the so-called moral standards that the theists come up with that's highly problematic as well um but it is a case of um us trying to get along in the world but what's the best way to do that and the, the whole thing of fear for me is is the is a nail in the coffin for it and and we could go through how would a god you know why would a, a supposedly semi-loving god because they can't say it's unconditionally no religion can say god is unconditionally loving so the christians come with a what i consider like a non i can't understand what they mean when they say all loving the muslims don't generally say that they just say god loves the believers type of a thing uh but then of course they throw in free will which of course if we've looked into that that's not a that's a non-starter either so we don't have free will in the sense most, most people understand so the whole thing that is based on is a fear-based foundation it's not based on good you are kind of in told you are cajoled into doing certain things out of a fear of not doing them and that that whole philosophy that ideology is like you say so foreign and i think that's a way to speak to people is go hey and because they've probably never thought about it in that way so it's, it's a case maybe we should do a hangout on just on morality itself compare islam with non with secularism etc and then see you know how does it stack up in reality because most people have not thought about it uh thank you guys it's been awesome this was a great conversation to have i think we covered a lot of good topics